Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Exercise Your Rights with the emphasis emphasis on exercise your rights. <laughs> and I'm here today with William Sterling. He has been self-publishing novels, which is no easy feat. As you know, I'm like super, prim I love self-published people. Um, it's not for everybody, though, but I do love people that have the gumption to, you know, just do it themselves, create their own opportunities. Um, he's been doing that for a decade, um, and this is his first foray into the traditional world with his novel, which is coming up in a few days, String Them Up, super creepy cover. I'm going to show that in just a few minutes, uh, but also there is going to be a giveaway, and the very creepy partner that he has with him, which is Sally the Seas All Doll. Um, we're going to be doing a little bit of an interview with her as well. Um, she has agreed to speak with us in a manner. And uh, yeah, we're going to find out all this super exciting thing. So stick around for this giveaway. Find out all that information. I believe Sally is the giveaway. She could be uh, she could be coming to your house. And that's not a threat, so don't get mad, okay? That is a good thing. That's why we're playing this off. <laughs> so welcome, William. So, so happy for you to be here on the show. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, that was a little bit of an introduction, but tell us a little bit about yourself and Killer... Uh, I'm sorry, Killer Mediums is your podcast. Yes. <laughs> up. We are also going to hear about Killer Mediums, but tell me a little bit about String Them Up as a book, your inspirations behind it, you as an author. Sure, of course. Um, so you already hit kind of the big thing with me. I've been writing for a very long time, uh, self-publishing novels off and on for the last eight to 10 years, somewhere in there. Um, and just finally taking the plunge into traditional publishing. I, I think I've realized my limits as a self-publisher. I've, I've pieced out what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. And uh, I decided with this book, I thought it was a strong enough book to actually put it on submission with places. I knew that it deserved a real marketing push and a real like uh, person that knows how to format books and ever <laughs> the, the whole kit and caboodle. I knew I wanted that for this book. Uh, and Crystal Lake Publishing, Crystal Lake Entertainment now, was gracious enough to take it on and working with Joe has been amazing and just building up to that. Um, I can't believe publishing days are finally here. I um, know. <laughs> it's, it's so weird jumping from self-publishing to traditional publishing because with self-publishing, you make the timeline and it's as fast as you want. So if I, if I wanted to put this book out, uh, a, a month after I finished it and got the feedback from the betas and made my tweaks, I, I could put it out a month later. Um, but String Them Up has been on the back burner for a year and a half now. So I am so just used to this story now to be ramping up marketing for it and to be like really focusing on it again after all that time. It's, it's kind of strange. It's, it's fun. It's exciting. Yeah. I, I'm enjoying revisiting this book that I've kind of forgotten about myself. I don't know. It's just a very different energy. Yeah, that's so cool. What do you say? I mean, I mean, I, I think neither one is better, like self-publishing versus traditional publishing. But what are some of the major differences? Obviously, the timeline, because you do kind of get used to doing your own thing when you're self-publishing. But what are some of the other differences you think you've noticed? Um, biggest differences I've noticed, uh, A, the timeline, um, but B, having a support system already built out for a book has helped me out in so many ways that I didn't realize it would. Um, Crystal Lake Entertainment has a lot of connections that I never would have been able to come with, come up with. They've got, um, they, they've got like lines with podcasters. Hello. Uh, <laughs> that I can, that I can talk to and meet who I, I might've never been on their radar or them on my radar. Otherwise they've got this whole marketing plan with readers already built in that as soon as they make a post about a giveaway, people are actually excited about it. Whereas with me, it's I'm giving this thing away. Somebody pay attention to me. And you're just Wait, kind of screaming. Into the whole <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so it's, it's just this very different set of strengths and weaknesses. But then with self-publishing, um, some fun things with that are having total creative control over everything. Um, I've got a, a cover artist that I love to death, NW Reader on Twitter, if, you, if, if you've never connected with her. She's amazing. 
Um, and I lucked out so much with Crystal Lake Entertainment where the, the cover for String Them Up, I had this like, little inspiration doodle sitting over my computer the whole time I was writing it. And Joe kind of emailed me back when, I, when he picked up the book and said, any ideas for the cover? And I said, well, I've got this thing. And they took it and made it gorgeous. So I oh, know wow. a lot of other authors that don't get any input on their covers. Uh, mm -hmm. Crystal Lake did me right. Um, I'm very awesome. happy with that. But I know that's not the norm uh, mm -hmm. with traditional publishing. So it's a lot of give and take on things like that. Uh, what, where are your priorities? Do you want total creative control or do you want a support network? Or yeah. Uh, since this is your first traditional, traditionally published book, um, do you have advice like for somebody who is self-publishing? Maybe what would you tell them if they wanted to try to break into that? Commit to query hell. <laughs> it is it is a long, painful process. Uh, I have been through so many rejections for books that I truly believe in uh, that it gets kind of disheartening after a while. But when you get the click and when it's with the right publisher, it is so validating um, yeah. and worth it. Um, so this... Uh, I think this is public knowledge. Now I've got string them up coming out with crystal Lake entertainment and they were 100% the right publisher for this book that the vibe is right there with them. Uh, and then I've got another book coming out next year through dark lit press, which is much more kind of goofy and weird. Uh, and it, it, it fits their vibe a little bit better. So just really targeting publishers that you would actually want to work with. And then just bracing for that rejection and hoping for the acceptance. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's that's good. And never, I mean, that's, as a publisher, I always want to be like, it's not you, it's us. Because there's so few spots that, you know, there's like a million stories and, and a million yeah. great books. So, like, just don't be discouraged. So, but I am glad that you found... Uh, a place for this one. String yes. up. I love the cover. So creepy. You can see the cover up in the corner over your head, over William's head. Um, yeah. T I don't want spoilers. I understand. <laughs> I mean, I do want spoilers because I am that person that will read the end of the book, but I realize it's not, a, not everybody likes that. What can you tell us about the book a little bit, like without giving us too many spoilers? You can message sure. me privately with any spoilers, okay. <laughs> but I'm going to be reading it in a few days anyway. So, perfect. Um, the uh, the elevator pitch for it, I guess we're going to go with. Um, the book is about a uh, detective on his way out uh, that has just been through a traumatic life experience uh, with his main job. He's seen his life upended and. Uh, to kind of hit the reset button a little bit, he accepts a job in a small rural town in Georgia called Hollow Hills, uh, working for and with somebody that he was friends with in the past. He he's been he's been told that this is going to be a soft reset for him and a way to kind of pull his life back in order. Um, but he gets there and then immediately shit starts to hit the fan. Uh, it's a horror book. You know, that's coming. Um, and <laughs> no uh, shit, nobody wants to read it, right? <laughs> exactly. There must be some shit hitting a fan somewhere. We need bodies or at least blood. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And we get both. Um, <laughs> and the, the, the malevolent occurrences, let's just call them that for for now leads uh, our main character Sinclair to the deranged toy maker that lives exiled on the outskirts of town and we get murder puppets from there. I love murder puppets. <laughs> so describe to me because murder puppets are like zombies and vampires and you know there's like a wide range of what these could be. Um, describe your murder puppets like it, it, unless it gives away spoilers. Sure. Um, okay, so my murder puppets are much more, they're much more small soldiers that, that old, I think it's Disney movie. Um, they're much more small soldiers oh, than yeah. Annabelle. Um, they are, they are, or they began life as toys, began their creation as like dolls for kids to play with. And they have since been 
animated by forces that we don't want to get into quite yet to be running around. So it's, it's not just a doll kind of showing up in a spooky place. I didn't leave you there. It's, it's people being chased down the road with a Chucky doll with a butcher knife in his hand. Uh, we, we go that direction. <laughs> That's awesome. Cause I do appreciate an active I mean, the slow creepiness of the doll left in the corner, you're wondering, that's good, but I really do like an active murder puppet. You know, one that really takes charge, is proactive, um, you know, really participates in their existence. I mean, that's the kind of murder puppet that I like. Yeah. So, right. um, this is coming out on September 22nd, so just a few days away. If you pre-order it now, though, you could have... Uh, Sally, which is next to you, Sally, which is your co-guest. Can we say co-guest? Um, uh, demonic supervisor. Maybe we demonic go that supervisor. Route. Yeah, I used to have a couple of those back in the Amazon <laughs> days. <laughs> but yeah, so you could you're you're letting your uh, demonic uh, supervisor go live with somebody else. This yes. is not passing on. It's not the same as passing on a curse. People, this is a gift from William to your house so that Sally can uh, not haunt quite is not the word I'm looking for, but you know, <laughs> demonically supervise you. We'll just say yes. that. Yes. So, and that is from this pre-order, everybody who pre-orders is going to have a chance to win Sally and be haunted or, you know, supervised by her. Right. Like, can you tell me a little bit about that? Like how can we get Sally? Yes. I want Sally. Um, so Sally was, uh, I'll, I'll do a quick shout out. Uh, Sally was created by Pollyanna's doll on Instagram, all one word. Um, I met her at a horror festival, uh, in Athens, Georgia a few months ago. And she had a lot of these, uh, monstrosities at a table. Um, well, we mean that in a nice way, Sally. Monstrosity yes, in a flattering way. <laughs> Yes, please don't hurt me again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but she was she was kind enough to uh, make Sally for me and uh, send her my way. So um, Sally sees all uh, has has had a rough life. Um, she made it to our house and has been tormenting us since, uh, casting her rage across me and my wife and my kids. And it's time for her to find a new home. Uh, the Very whispers in the middle of the night. <laughs> yes, yes. So generous of you to pass that on. <laughs> of course. Um, I can't do it anymore. I can't do another sleepless night. But anyhow, um, so in order to enter the pre-order official, uh, in order to enter the sweepstakes officially, let's use that word. Um, what we are asking people to do is if you pre-order the book, string them up, and then you email proof of the pre-order to Crystal Lake Publishing's Gmail account. Uh, they will give, give you one entry into the giveaway. Uh, and then if you select the book as want to read on Goodreads, you can have a second entry. And I think that the, um, the head of Crystal Lake Publishing is going to draw a name from the hat on publishing day september 22nd so you've got Ooh. kind of a small window here to get in but it's still a it's still a window yeah yeah absolutely um, all right so this is happening um sally would you like to come live with me because i'm going to pre-order this book so that you can come live with me in fact I mean, we do like to, um, you know, I'm all about the unquiet voices and giving everybody a chance to speak. Um, can, do you mind, would it be okay with you if I asked Sally a few questions? You can certainly try. <laughs> um, Sally, I do appreciate you being here. Don't hurt me. Um, I mean, in the best, most respectful way, um, what do you think of this book about murder puppets? Do you feel like the murder puppets were portrayed in a fair way? Do you think William really, um, is, he, is he being honest and true in the portrayal of murder puppets? I don't want it to be one of those things where he's assuming what a murder puppet is like. And then, you know. Okay. Oh, okay. So maybe no comment, I think, Sally. But I do feel like I saw her smiling a little bit mm -hmm. more. So I feel like that was kind of like that she feels approval. You'll you'll find out later tonight, maybe, you know. Yes. When, when I wake up to the vicious mockery, uh, 
Yes, uh, yes. I'll send you a private message. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, and I've noticed you have a hurt finger there. So I was kind of like, is that, I mean, I don't want to mm-hmm. point fingers necessarily because my finger might also get hurt. Uh, but was that a maybe Sally thing? I mean, how active is she in your house? Um, the doctor referred to this as mallet finger. And ever since we have not found a hammer in our household, we had three. Now we have zero. Mm. Um, yep. No, no fingers pointed. No fingers <laughs> pointed. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, um, thank you, Sally. With your permission, Sally, we will move on a little bit. Um, I kind of wanted to find out about killer mediums a little bit, your podcast. Um, yes. Um, but if you would like to speak in, you know, pipe up at any time, Sally, and we will give you the floor. <laughs> I've got a candle lit behind me and we'll just see it flare to life all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes. Uh, so Killer Mediums is a podcast that I've been running for a little over a year now. Um, the idea behind it is that I wanted to talk to horror creators from different mediums of entertainment, but I'm <laughs> um, about what it's like to uh, to create in different avenues of entertainment because I I love writing novels. It is so fun for me. I've also got some dreams of working as a screenwriter potentially and just kind of getting involved in some other stuff too. Um, so it kind of started as like a pet project of mine just to pick people's brains a little bit. And then it evolved into, oh, this is actually interesting stuff. Other people might want to listen to this. So why don't I record it? Um, but that it's so much like this show. How weird! <laughs> I just do the thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, with each episode, the the basic approach is me and the creator are going to pick a trope that we want to dig into, and we'll pick three or four different uh, topics from that trope to talk about. Uh, in theory, it's going to be a trope that the creator has worked in before. So, like mm-hmm. one of our biggest episodes was with Paul Tremblay. Uh, He came on right before Knock at the Cabin came out, and he talked about trying to make ambiguous horror in book form versus film. Um, And a little bit, it was before the movie came out, so we couldn't go full spoiler into it, but we talked a little bit about what that was like trying to translate his ideas into book form and what that was like versus um, what he saw happening with the movie and kind of the directions that M. Night Shyamalan was pulling that Uh, I've also talked to Josh Rubin. So we talked about uh, being secluded with strangers in horror because all of his movies kind of have that through line on it. Scare me and werewolves within. They're kind of locked down in a spot Uh, and what it's like trying to make those scenes and keep those settings interesting while you're stuck in a room with two, three, 20 people. sometimes. but yeah, we, we've got a lot more episodes than that. Uh, some really cool guests have come on and lent their time to me. I feel so fortunate to have been able to interact with them in any way, shape or form. But I don't know. It's been a lot of fun. That's awesome. Um, I'm going to have the links to this in the description. But can you tell us, like, where can we find you? What platforms are you on? I've got it launching to all platforms, I think think. Uh, I know I have personally seen it on Spotify and Apple Podcasts uh, and Zencaster. Uh, and in theory, it's also projecting to all the other main ones. But um, if somebody wanted to verify that for me, it would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yes, and I will have that down there. I've also, uh, we did a little Sally the Seasall doll. That's how you spell it. That's in the ticker below. Um, and again, you can win that win. I was going to say that, but that seems very disrespectful. Win her, Sally, the Seasall doll, by pre-ordering this book. Honestly, I'm not positive what she takes offense to or not. I just know I'll find out after the fact. So Yeah, yeah, because I was actually like, well, that was very assumptive of me to <laughs> that she identifies as, I don't actually know her pronouns. So, you know, forgive me, Sally. Maybe I don't want to win her then if I pissed her <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's a great house guest. Somebody take her, please. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you, you've got like a little tear. Is that? A, are you okay? But Help if you. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you would like to save, I mean, um, you know, win Sally, then you know, you know what to do. Um, 
Gosh, now my brain is stuck on that. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about the cover. You said that it was, you had the little illustration of your computer and then Joe just kind of went with that. Did you have anything else to do with the cover? Or did you get to chat with the cover designer? Um, A little bit. Uh, <laughs> so the, the cover is showing one of the highlight kills from kind of the turn of the book as we realized that uh, or I guess we're going to know all along because of the cover, but as Sinclair realizes that this stuff is all for real, um, they find a body strung up by his innards, like a puppet hanging over town square. Um, so that was, that was like the first vision that really drove me to write the book. So having mm -hmm. that on the vision board the whole time was very like keeping me focused and keeping me like working towards that sort of a mood. Um, when I sent it off to the cover artist, I didn't hear anything back for a long time. Again, traditional publishing, that's the norm, apparently. <laughs> um, just these long windows. Um, and then they sent back a, a cover that was really close to what we've got now, but the strings were just kind of going out all over the place, like a spider web or something. So mm -hmm. uh, I got to request a couple of edits to make it a little bit more puppet like to, to like yeah. pull the body in certain angles. But I, Otherwise, there wasn't much I needed to comment on. They they understood the assignment. Yeah, um, very and, effective spooky cover. Yes, thank you. <laughs> what do you think it is? Because puppets, of course, I mean, we're drawn to They're not like super common, I think, in horror. But they're, they're a solid creep factor, like hearing the child giggle in an empty house. Puppets are also always creepy. I don't care what they say about Pinocchio. What do you think are some of the creepy things about them that they're like controlled? Is it a control issue between people and, you know, like, why do you think, why are puppets creepy to you? I know why they're creepy to me because they're puppets, but no offense, Sally. Um, that was not, you know, directed at you. <laughs> I mean, that in the most flattering way. <laughs> or her ears. Does she have ears? Yes. Okay. Um, Oh man, I, I I have just an hour long answer I could give to this. Um, <laughs> I've got I've got personal experiences that make them creepy to me. Um, also, I think just by their nature, there's a few things that are very unsettling about puppets. Um, I'm actually writing, I guess the best word for it is an article right now for Chuck Wendig's blog. Uh, he's got a five things I learned while writing series that he that he puts out and I'm, I'm writing an entry for that. So the, the five things article that I've been working on all day is five things I learned about murder puppets while writing, string them up. So this is like, this is front of my mind right now. Oh, that's um, awesome. I guess, let me, let me start with the, the story from my youth and then we can build up to just in, in general, why I think they're creepy. Um, as I was growing up, we had an aunt and an uncle that lived in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, right downtown, one of those houses that's been there since the Civil War era, probably. I don't know. I'm not great at history. Um, but it is it, it is this old building where the boards all creak as you walk along them and just like perfect haunted house fodder. Um, and whenever we went over there to visit, the, they didn't have enough bedrooms for everybody to have their own bedroom. So my brother and I would always be uh, shuttled off to the attic when it was time to go to sleep. This is a big unfinished attic. And my aunt had a large collection of antique dolls that she just lined up on one of the sides of the room. Um, so I am five or six years old being brought upstairs to the attic being warned repeatedly look there are spots missing in the floor here please don't step there if you get up in the middle of the night Ooh, watch out for that rusty nail right there don't bang your head on that if you get up in the night also these dolls are going to be watching you the whole time so i just remember waking up for summer after summer paralyzed in fear because you can feel the things watching you um, they are just lifelike enough that it kind of gives you that prick in the back of your neck. And the eyes look just realistic enough that you can't shake that feeling that you're being watched. Um, so, yeah, three in the morning, waking up to go wow. get water and this this wall of things watching me made it 
bit of an impression. Yeah, I would think so. That would be pretty nightmarish, I think. I think I had one doll and I was terrified. Uh, it was it, it was a lot. But I, I think that kind of gets into my first point uh, for for why dolls are scary in general is because we kind of go into that uncanny valley <laughs> concept a little bit. You can be walking through a room and just mistake a doll sitting in a chair for a real kid. And for a few moments there, your brain is going to be just frazzled enough and confused enough. Like, was that real? No, that's definitely not real. That's a doll there. But there's that moment of confusion. I think creepy murder dolls work really well in books and movies because if you flip that switch, you can just create chaos in an instant. You can have characters that are completely unsettled because now they can't trust anything anymore. They thought it was real and then they decided it wasn't real and now it's real again. And where does the spinning stop? Nobody knows. We're just going to go die now. Um, we've got that. We've got the idea that whenever kids are playing with dolls, um, there's this projection thing that goes on with them. Um, whenever kids or adults or anybody is playing yeah. with a doll, you, you put a little bit of yourself into whatever story you're telling. Um, we, it, this is unfortunate, but it helps highlight a point. So I'll go ahead and use it. Um, I've got a three-year-old kid right now that came home from school the other day and he's got a little bruise on his arm. Buddy, what happened? No, no, no. And he goes and keeps playing. Later on that day, he's sitting around playing with his action figures and he's talking about one of the action figures hitting the other action figure on the playground. And it's like, hmm. I see this now. Um, fortunately for me, my kid is mostly pure of heart. Um, and I don't need to worry about the things he's revealing to me through these stories. But I think something that's creepy and good horror fodder with puppets is what if somebody that's not pure of heart is playing with these things? What if somebody mm -hmm. evil is demonstrating their intentions through these dolls? Um, the doll itself doesn't have to be evil necessarily. Um, but maybe you, the puppet you master choose. is. <laughs> you choose, Sally. <laughs> <laughs> you could be good. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I've got a couple other ideas, but I'll, I'll go ahead and cap it at that because I feel like I've been rambling for a minute now. No, it's a super interesting rambling and very creepy. <laughs> I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head so many times and, and just dolls in general. You know, you've got the voodoo dolls and the, mm -hmm. you know, I, I mean, we're fascinated with this whole idea, maybe because we do grow up with them. And as we're growing up, they're speaking in other voices. That's completely real to us, you know, as a kid, as a kid, they're not real to me anymore. Um, you know, and that just kind of stays with us that possibility. Maybe as a kid, it's also like, were they like, maybe we're still a little bit convinced that that all really happened, even though everybody's telling us it's just a doll, you know, you're never just a doll, Sally. So um, I blame yeah. the story. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> I'd actually love to invite you to read, but I didn't get you prepared beforehand. So no pressure. But if you have something handy to read just for, you know, a few minutes, as long as you want. Um, sure. Let me. No pressure. This is William with no practice. Like, <laughs> boom. How would you like to do this thing? <laughs> yeah. Let me let me give you uh, or <laughs> could you give me 30 seconds to get it pulled yeah, up and I'll absolutely. find I'll find absolutely. a chapter here. Um, yes, I've got something to read. Um, so this is going to be the scene kind of leading up to finding the hanging body. Um, Ooh, it is, I love hanging bodies. Yes. I mean, um, theoretically, not for real. <laughs> right, right, right. Let's clarify. So the FBI gets mm -hmm, off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not for real, of course. <laughs> um, all right. All right. So yeah, this is if a you're ready, but... I'm going to give you the whole screen. I'm going to disappear so that we can just look at you and Sally. Of oh, no. Okay. Yeah. And then I'll be back as soon as you're done. Okay. I, I apologize for my ugly mug. Um, oh. But here we go. All right. So this is about two fifths of the way through the book. Um, we are we are aware that the puppets and the dolls are things, but we're not sure exactly what they're up to yet. 
That night, as Sinclair wrestled with his usual nightmares and Johnny lay passed out on his desk at the station, computer screen glowing with information about state-approved sheep slaughtering protocols, Mayor Bellman tipped back the last of an expensive glass of bourbon. It was late, later than Bellman usually stayed up, but tonight he was celebrating. Gregory Rochester was finally in jail. Not that he'd really proved to be much of a nuisance to Bellman these past few years, but just the fact that Rochester was out there in the world, knowing what he knew, suspecting what he suspected, it had put Bellman in a position of weakness. There had been a constant threat of Rochester snapping and running his mouth to the wrong people, ruining everything Bellman and the Gaddises had built here in Hollow Hills. More than once, Bellman had toyed with plans to silence the man himself, but they were all too risky, too uncertain for him to ever willingly act on, especially not after last time. But it had all worked out, hadn't it? The old loon had painted himself into a corner, and now all Bellman had to do was find the right lawyer, some cutthroat shark of a litigator, and he could have Rochester gone for good. No more loose ends. He set his glass down on the nightstand and felt a sense of calm which had eluded him for years. He climbed into bed, his wife already fast asleep and lightly, lightly snoring beside him. Tomorrow he would reach out to Hal Sharpton. Hal was a true blue bastard, a mean son of a bitch who attacked the courtroom like a rabid dog whenever he got the scent of something good, something with money. He would be perfect. Then Bellman's road to re-election would be paved for him. Not that he'd anticipated any real competition to start with, but arresting and removing the town's freak show would have the public singing his praises, especially after everybody saw him at the station today, assisting in the arrest. He was a mayor who was willing to roll up his sleeves, get his hands dirty, they'd all say. Some of them would even know how true that statement really was. The gears in his head spinning, his delusions of grandeur amplified by his slight inebriation, Bellman found it hard to fall asleep immediately, which was part of how he found himself awake, still, at about 2.30 when his front, when his front window shattered. From all the way upstairs, the noise came across as little more than a slight tinkling sound, but it was enough to cat, catch the mayor's attention, and he rose from bed in the middle of the night. Bellman grabbed a baseball bat from out of his closet and reopened the bedroom door. All seemed quiet on the upstairs landing. Both of his kids' doors were closed, and the mayor heard nothing but his kids' white noise machines hissing from within their rooms. There was no pitter-patter of his children's tiny feet downstairs, which might have explained a knocked-over lamp or a dropped glass or otherwise. Nope. All seemed silent. Bellman retreated into his room, found his slippers, then made his way to the closer of the two circular staircases, which led to the main floor. He kept a tight grip on the handle of his bat and stared down towards the first floor, tiptoeing as quietly as he could manage, the bat cocked and ready over his shoulder. The front entryway was littered with broken glass that reflected light from the kitchen. Miss Bellman insisted on keeping the light from their oven hood perpetually burning through the night in case one of the kids woke up and started wandering the house before the sun. Bellman made it to the landing and looked around to his left and right. The slim window to the left of the front door had been blown inwards. That much was apparent. But what had blown out the glass, Bellman couldn't tell. The mayor wandered back and forth looking for signs of anything that might have caused the damage. No brick or ball or rock lay in the front lobby, though. Doing his best detective impression, Bellman tried to think through what else might have happened. Maybe a fist, then? Maybe some robber knocked the glass out so they could reach an arm in, unfasten the lock from the backside? Bellman investigated the door and found the latch still fastened. But that didn't really prove anything, did it? The burglar could have easily let themselves in, then latched the door behind them, making it seem like they'd never come in. So maybe it was a stealthy robber, then? One who was trying to cover their tracks? The night was getting interesting. Mayor Bellman protects own home from intruder. The headline would play nicely, especially well with male voters aged 20 to 40. He wondered what would make the front page of the Hollow Gazette. His heroism or Rochester's demise? He turned around slowly, dragging his slippers instead of stepping so that he could avoid crunching any of the glass on the ground, making as little noise as possible as he crept towards the kitchen. He checked his corners as he snuck, trying to make sure no robber could get the jump on him. The kitchen was empty. The dishwasher hummed softly when their housekeeper had filled it after dinner, uh, from, where, from when their housekeeper had filled it after dinner and set it to run. The pantry sat closed, apparently undisturbed. Not a fool, Bellman grabbed the handle to the pantry, whipped it open with his bat held at the ready, empty. Cans of vegetables, baskets of bread, and various cheeses stared innocently back at him until Bellman closed the door slowly, quietly. He turned and made his way through the saloon doors, which separated the kitchen from the dining area, and peered through the slats at the darkness beyond. The dining room was just as vacant as the kitchen had been. Where is this fucker? 
Bellman whispered to himself, his excitement at hunting an intruder quickly giving way to frustration. The main floor bathroom was empty, as was the laundry room, as was the coat closet. Bellman stabbed the coats in the closet with his baseball bat, hoping to hear a yelp, but there was nothing. The silence of the house around him seemed to be taunting him at this point. Maybe there wasn't an intruder after all. Maybe the window had just shattered. It was stupid, but the illogical thought kept bouncing around to Bellman's head, causing his irritation to deepen. Maybe the window had been fractured long before, and the pressure from the cold house, coupled with the heat outside, had just broken it the rest of the way. Maybe. He walked into the living room carelessly, having mostly given up on finding anything of note. The doll was seated in the middle of the coffee table, and the appearance of it, with its striking blue eyes reflecting some undiscernible light source, caused Bellman to yelp and almost drop his bat. It was an old ventriloquist dummy. Its jaw hung slack, but otherwise the puppet sat straight up with perfect posture. Brown plastic had been molded on its head to imitate the slicked, black, slicked back brown hair, and its suit bore a striking similarity to one of the suits Bellman threw on whenever he was on the campaign trail. The damn maid. She was supposed to clean up all the kids' toys before she left. Emphasis on all of the toys. The mayor checked under the couches and behind his easy chair, making sure the doll wasn't just some distraction the intruder was using to sneak up on him. But no, Bellman was still alone. The mayor groaned and tapped his baseball bat against his foot. He lifted the doll up by the throat and carried it with him as he checked the other rooms, humbly performing the maid's job for her. He would bring the doll upstairs to Emma's room. It was more likely hers than Keith's. He liked video games nowadays. Dolls and action figures were more Emma's thing. He was pretty sure. Bellman would dock the babe's pay tomorrow to teach her a lesson about thoroughness. The doll felt warm in his hands, like maybe some electronics inside were malfunctioning, and its eyes did that trick where they seemed like they were always following you. Bellman hated the thing. He cleared the rest of the house quickly, hurrying so that he could go back upstairs to drop the doll near his kid's door and be done with it. The effects of the whiskey were wearing off, and the adrenaline that accompanied a possible home invasion had dulled. Exhaustion from a long day had finally caught up to him, and by the time Bellman had checked around their home gym, he didn't much care if there really was an intruder anymore. Maybe the window had just shattered on its own. Maybe some small pebble from outside had been slung on the wind and broken through, lying now among the shards of glass. He'd find it first thing in the morning, for sure. How silly of him to assume somebody was in his house, right? Stray pebble shattering a window was totally normal. Probably. Maybe. His slippers slipped... His slippers slapped the wooden staircase as Bellman ascended, wavering slightly in his drunken, sleep-deprived disorientation. Emma's room was closed, so the mayor laid what he thought was his daughter's doll against the door, propping it up so it would fall inwards when Emma awoke. He looked at the doll again as he backed away, its eyes still catching whatever blue light it had reflected downstairs. He scanned the, land he scanned the upstairs landing, trying for a second time to determine the source of the glow. There was a yellow nightlight glowing down the hall, but nothing blue. Oh, well. The mayor backed away from the toy, blaming his delusions and weird conclusions on the late hour, the good whiskey, and just the whole Rochester situation from earlier. He hadn't thought the loon had gotten into his head, but he was certainly feeling jumpier than usual tonight. Bellman passed through his bedroom, his wife still snoring on her half of the bed, and entered the bathroom. He relieved himself, kicked off his slippers, and returned to the room ready to pass out. Maybe if he had been sober, Bellman would have noticed the way his wife had suddenly stopped snoring. Maybe if it hadn't been three in the morning, Bellman would have realized that somebody or something had closed the bedroom door behind him. Maybe if Bellman hadn't still been dreaming about news articles about himself, he would have noticed the wires which had been draped across his covers, the glitter of fishing hooks tied to their ends. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Bellman climbed into bed, laying right on top of a series of thin metal that zigged and zagged like mesh over the comforter. He tugged on the blanket, confused about why it wouldn't budge. From the darkness, something jerked the ends of the strings, and the hooks sprang to life, lurching towards Bellman, piercing his skin and shoving their jagged tips deep through muscle and tissue until they raked at his bones. One hook caught the side of the mayor's neck, burying itself deep in the crook between his shoulder blade and his collarbone. Another caught him behind his kneecap as another ripped a gash in his scrotum. At least 20 others found purchase all up and down his body, simultaneously ravishing their pounds of flesh. Bellman screamed as he felt his body pierced like a pincushion. It was a wonder that such a wild, desperate sound didn't wake the children, even with their white noise machine set at full blast. He tried to resist the onslaught, but the hooks tore at his skin from every angle. No matter which direction he pulled, his struggles drew the wires more and more taut. 
His hot blood coated the sheets and soaked the mattress as Bellman thrashed back and forth, screaming at the top of his lungs, hoping Mrs. Bellman might hear him. But the bed was empty beside him, with Mrs. Bellman already pulled into the darkness. From the shadows, little arms pulled on their ends of the line, setting their hooks deeper and deeper into their prey, until finally, with a sudden, coordinated heave, the hooks all jerked in the same direction at once to rip Bellman free from his bed. His head cracked against the floor as he landed, and Bellman was permanently silenced by the blow. In the absence of his cries, the mayor's house returned to its typical middle-of-the-night, regularly scheduled orchestra of soothing sounds. The kids' sound machines were whirred away. The wind caused an American flag to flap about on the front porch, and if not for the scraping sounds of a body being dragged down the concrete driveway, things might have seemed entirely natural around Mayor Bellman's residence. Ta-da! Wow. <laughs> All right. Well, I know that pre-order link is being clicked right now. <laughs> it is below in the description. I cannot wait to read all this. That was such a good, satisfying description. Um, hey. it's, it's not that I don't like mayors and bureau bureaucracy or anything. <laughs> that was so satisfying, you know. Just saying. So right? yeah, well done. Like fabulous, fabulous reading as well. Like I enjoyed your Thank performance you. of it as well as the material. So gosh, that was like awesome. I just oh. clicked back over here and realized I had been leaning into the camera the entire time and you were just watching <laughs> my ugly mouth kind of, I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> no, I, you know, I think my eyes were not actually watching you. They were kind of spaced up. Like <laughs> I was not seeing you. I was seeing this drunk guy creeping through his house. What an asshole, you know, hoping it's a house. <laughs> yeah, well done. Well, Thanks. Thank you so much for this great interview. Thank you for the reading, the incredible reading you just did. Um, do you want to tell everybody a little bit about where they can find you and your other works too? Like, feel free to talk about the other books that you were publishing for a decade, um, your podcast, all of that, where we can find you. Of course, all the links are in the description box below so you can find this. Sure. Um, anybody that wants to talk to me, I am always interested in finding new friends and chatting. Um, I'm on Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it nowadays. Um, it is at spooky underscore Sterling. Um, same thing with Instagram. I'm on there too. Same handle at spooky underscore Sterling. I have a blue sky account, but I haven't figured out how to actually blue sky correctly yet. Um, but that I think is spooky dot Sterling at B S K Y dot. Please shorten your handle things. <laughs> Um, but if you, yeah, if you search for me on there, I'm pretty easy to find still. Um, and then killer mediums is anywhere you can get your podcasts. Um, other books, the, the one that I still really kind of promote and push is, uh, I have a reverse slasher series, uh, called killer be killed that, uh, I've been trying to make a trilogy out of. So the first one starts as a reverse camp slasher. Uh, I keep saying reverse because anytime you watch a camp slasher, you find yourself like subtly cheering for the monster from the woods to, to go get the counselors because that makes things more fun. Um, and I always felt kind of weird and bad about that. Like I shouldn't be cheering for a mass murderer. So I tried to write a book where you were openly encouraged to cheer for the monster from the woods to go kill all of the horrendous people around this summer camp. Um, and it got really good reactions and I had a whole lot of fun writing it. So I followed it up with uh, a sequel that's a reverse home invasion. Again, same premise, cheer for the, the, the monster coming in and wrecking this house and uh, I've got the conclusion coming out next year at some point. I'm going to try to wrap awesome. it up as a self-published trilogy. That's awesome. Yeah, and way to like relieve us of the guilt because we know we all know we're cheering. <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest about it. <laughs> Go for it, Jason. Do do the thing, Jason. Yeah, like <laughs> violence and death is wrong, children. But we mm -hmm. like it. But we like it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, fictionally, in a theoretical, right, right, fictional right. sense, you know, not for real. <laughs> Again, FBI, we're so sorry. Yeah, we're just, you know, writers, crazy writers. <laughs> don't pay attention to us now. <laughs> Nothing to see here. 
So, all right. Well, awesome. Do you have anything else you want to share? I mean, you've been a fabulous interview and this has been so much fun. I'm so excited yeah. about this book. <laughs> Yes, me too. Uh, I'm glad to be talking about it. I'm glad it's getting out there. I'm I'm just thrilled to be here. So yeah, nothing awesome. else to talk about. Thank you so much for having me on. This was a blast. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And for you guys watching, don't forget you have just a few days left to go and pre-order this book and possibly, possibly be haunted. I mean, you know, win Sally uh, to come home to you. She's Sally sees all. Um, because she has that one super efficient eye, I think. So, yes, yeah. that is horrifying and terrifying. <laughs> yes, I'm going to She's my pride right. and joy. <laughs> She's beautiful. I can see why. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we'll just keep saying that. See you, Sally. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for watching the show. Go to the links to find everything you need. And I'll see you next Saturday. Bye. Bye.